thank you, Michael. And it's a delight to be here. And I'm glad I, uh, this is the first talk I've given in front of a live audience in well over a year. So I'm actually, uh, even though there aren't very many of you uh, in person, I'm excited to see you as well as all of those of you who are online. Um, and uh, uh, I guess, uh, I, what I wanted to talk about today, and it's kind of evolved since I, since I first agreed to do this, is uh, what has been going on with two places in particular. One is Hong Kong and one is Taiwan. Um, and we'll talk more about exactly what's going on with them. Um, but uh, although there are different places, it turns out there is a connection between them, which I will talk about today. So in the last year, we've seen two major events in East Asia, one of which received a lot of attention and the other of which maybe didn't. Um, and, uh, but, they, but they are linked and it's possible that they even pretend even more momentous events that could occur in the region over the next few years. The first event was the crushing of the democracy movement in Hong Kong. Oh, by the way, this is, I was asked to provide PowerPoint slides. This is the only slide with words on it. So all the other slides will be pictures. Um, and what that means is, I know there's traditionally a quiz at the end of these talks. So we're gonna forego the quiz this time. So you don't have to write anything down, but you can uh, draw pictures if you want. Okay, so uh, here we go. Crushing of the democracy movement in Hong Kong. Uh, you've probably heard about this one, um, but the second event, which you may not have heard about, was the re-election in Taiwan of um, uh, the president and her party maintaining control over Taiwan's legislature. Now, uh, that doesn't sound very momentous. That is essentially a continuation of the status quo, but it is, in fact, significant. Uh, particularly in light of the first event, the crushing of democracy movement in Hong Kong. So, but to explain why that is the case, I need to review some history. So the territory of Hong Kong was originally part of China, um, but in the 19th century, during the first and second opium wars, uh, Britain acquired first the island of Hong Kong and then the Kowloon Peninsula. I think I have a map, there we go. Uh, oh, this is where I use my laser pointer. So, um, so that's the island of Hong Kong. And this thing here, just the kind of dark shaded part, that's Kowloon. So that was what the British originally acquired in a couple of wars in 1840 and 1860. Um, and then in 1898, uh, Britain acquired uh, a 99 year lease. So the first two pieces of land were actually ceded to Britain in perpetuity by the Imperial Chinese government at the time. But in the case of the rest of the territory, which is all the outlying islands and this uh, relatively large land area back here are called the new territories. And those were leased to Britain for 99 years. Um, and it, it, that area actually comprises about 86% of China's total land area. Now, Hong Kong was originally just a malarial island off of China's southern coast, but over time uh, it thrived under the British rule and became a, a uh, bustling center for trade and finance. Uh, this was a result of the combination of its location close to the Chinese mainland as well as the uh, predictability and fairness of the British legal system. Uh, the result of all that was by the late, nine, late 20th century, uh, China, uh, Hong Kong, sorry, actually had one of the highest per capita incomes in Asia. And uh, in fact, some of the wealthiest people in the world, one of the things that they used to say, I don't know if it's still true, is that there were more Rolls Royces per capita in Hong Kong than any other city in the world, including my hometown of Los Angeles. Um, but uh, back in 1898, uh, 99 years probably seemed like forever, but even forever has a way of coming around eventually. 
And uh, in this case, the precipitating event was actually property leases. Um, so in Hong Kong, property leases are usually for 15 years. Uh, well, 1898 plus 99 is 1997. And so that means around 1982, people in Hong Kong who had property leases in the new territories were starting to wonder, were those leases still going to be valid after 1997? And as a result of that, the British government approached the Chinese government with the idea of extending the lease on the new territories, who knows, for another 99 years or something. Now, up until then, the Chinese government really hadn't shown a lot of interest in Hong Kong. In fact, Chairman Mao, there he is, had famously referred to it as a pimple on China's butt. Um, but actually, Hong Kong was quite uh, important to Hong Kong as a sort of airlock between Hong Kong, between China and the outside world, where things, goods, and ideas from the outside world could be brought to China's doorstep, where the Chinese government could examine them and decide which ones it actually wanted to bring all the way into China. Um, by 1982, however, uh, China was four years into uh, a reform and opening program that had been launched after Chairman Mao's death uh, under Deng Xiaoping, he's the little guy there. Um, and as part of this program, they had created what were called uh, four of them, special economic zones. These were enclaves on the Chinese mainland where capitalist practices were allowed. Um, and uh, as sort of an experiment to see what types of economic principles they might want to uh, expand to the rest of China. And, uh, and, and here we have Britain approaching uh, the Beijing government about uh, this lease on Hong Kong and it occurred to China's leaders that maybe this was an opportunity to both erase a reminder of China's humiliation at the hands of the imperial powers in the 19th century, uh, while at the same time maintaining Hong Kong's utility not only as a window to the outside world, but also increasingly as a source of capital and expertise for the Chinese mainland. As a result, rather than offering the British an extension of the lease on the new territories, the Chinese government pushed for the return of the entire territory of Hong Kong. Now, China had all the leverage in this discussion um, because under international law, Britain could not legally insist on re retaining the new territories without China's consent, unless, of course, they wanted to fight another opium war. So, um, and here was the other problem. The, uh, first of all, Hong Kong and Kowloon were dependent on the new territories for almost all of their fresh water. Uh, but more importantly, um, most of the people who worked in Hong Kong and Kowloon actually lived in the new territories, which, uh, let me get my laser pointer again, um, which really begins about where this red line is. It's called Boundary Street. So this was kind of where everyone lived and then they would commute into Kowloon and Hong Kong Island. So uh, those two pieces were really not viable without the new territories. Um, so long story short, in 1984, uh, China and Britain came to an agreement that uh, all of Hong Kong would be returned to, uh, to Beijing in, when the 99-year lease expired in 1997. However, uh, as part of the agreement, Beijing did promise that Hong Kong would be allowed to retain its capitalist economic system, its social freedoms, and its British legal system for at least 50 years after the handover. Beijing uh, took to calling this arrangement one country, two systems, meaning that Hong Kong would be part of China, that's the one country, but would operate under a different political, legal, and economic system from the rest of China. Now, this really wasn't much of a concession on Beijing's part since uh, Hong Kong had become such an important uh, engine of China's success, uh, China's own economic development by that time. And that was uh, largely because of Hong Kong's special 
political, economic, and legal status. Now, Hong Kong had never been a democracy. Um, uh, since it became a British territory, the governor of Hong Kong, um, and that's the first governor, and I've forgotten his name, so I'm going to call him Lord Paddington. Uh, the governor of Hong Kong was imported, uh, uh, was imported, well, he was imported, he was appointed uh, in London, he would be sent to Hong Kong to govern over the colony for a certain number of years, and then would return to uh, merry old England. Um, and the Chinese uh, said, oh, and there was also a legislature, um, but most of the members of the legislature were actually appointed by the governor. Uh, by the time of the handover, only about a third of them were directly elected. The rest were appointed in various ways, some by so-called functional contingencies that represented things like lawyers and businessmen and circus clowns and other important groups of people. Um, but, uh, and so China was actually quite fine with this system. The uh, main difference being that um, rather than uh, appointing the uh, governor in London, he would be appointed by Beijing. But uh, China said in their case, they weren't gonna send someone from uh, the mainland. They would uh, hire, uh, appoint a local, uh, to run the place. And so the first one, uh, the first governor of Hong Kong is on the left there, Tong Chi Hua, um, who was a shipping magnate and was uh, designated as Hong Kong's first, they called it a chief executive at that point. And then on his right, on our right is the infamous Li Peng, uh, who was the premier of China at the time. So that was the system uh, that was implemented when Hong Kong was handed over in 1997. And for the most part, the transition went pretty smoothly, at least initially. Now let's go back to the late 19th century and talk about another imperial power, Japan. So after the Meiji Restoration that followed Commodore Perry's famed forced opening of Japan in 1854, Japan had rapidly modernized and quite quickly actually joined the ranks of the other imperial powers that were trying to force China open at the time. In 1894 and 95, Japan and China fought a brief war, um, which Japan won decisively. And one of their prizes from that war was a large but undeveloped island off of China's Southeast coast. And just in case, you need help, I will point it out to you, this island here, which is Taiwan. Um, and uh, so it, it was relatively undeveloped, but uh, Japan decided they wanted that as part of their expanding empire. And over the years that followed, they, uh, oops, they sought to assimilate uh, Taiwan into the Japanese, greater Japanese empire. They constructed roads and railroads. This is a building in uh, downtown Taipei. I, I believe this is a colorized black and white photograph from that era. Um, now, uh, Japanese rule was brutal and oppressive and intensely resented by the local population. Then uh, World War II came along and I hope, hope none, none of you are reading in history books right now, but spoiler alert, the Japanese lost. And uh, in 1945, Japan was returned to the control of what was then the Republic of China, which was run by the Nationalist Party, also known as the Guomindang or KMT. And the people of Taiwan were initially delighted to uh, be part of China again until they discovered that the government of the Republic of China was every bit as brutal and repressive as the Japanese. This resulted in protests that were uh, viciously put down in February of 1947 and followed by what became known in Taiwan as the White Terror. Okay, here's another spoiler. In 1949, the Republic of China is defeated by the Chinese communists um, in the Chinese Civil War. And the defeated remnants of the ROC 
military and government retreated to Taiwan where they hoped to regroup, uh, recover and retake the mainland. Well, um, as you're probably aware, that never happened, but due to the Korean War, a mutual defense treaty with the United States and the inherent difficulty of launching an amphibious evasion across 90 miles of water, Taiwan did manage to remain independent of the mainland um, and for a long time continued to claim, in fact, to be the sole legitimate government of all China. Starting uh, with Nixon's visit to mainland China in 1972, however, the United States began to move closer to mainland China as a counterbalance to the growing power of the Soviet Union. And this culminated in, on January 1st, 1979, with the United States switching formal diplomatic recognition from the Republic of China to the People's Republic of China and terminating the US ROC Mutual Defense Treaty. Now this development coincided with the launch of China's reform and opening economic program under Deng Xiaoping, there he is again, uh, which I mentioned earlier. And that was not a coincidence. In fact, the prestige that Deng acquired by getting the United, Nation, uh, United States to switch relations uh, to Beijing was part of what enabled him to push through his ideas for economic reform and development. Um, now, with the termination of the mutual defense treaty with the United States, it looked like Taiwan was in a pretty difficult spot. But on that very same day, January 1st, 1979, a senior Chinese official, retired Field Marshal Ye Jing, um, uh, delivered what he called a New Year's Day speech to his Taiwan compatriots, um, in which he declared that if Taiwan accepted unification with the mainland, it would be allowed to keep its own government, its capitalist way of life, and even its own military. Oh, there he is. Uh, now, you'll notice that this offer sounds kind of familiar, and um, although there's key differences between the proposal for Taiwan and what was implemented for Hong Kong, Beijing eventually began to use the same term, one country, two systems, to describe its offer to Taiwan as well. Um, at the same time, however, Beijing explicitly reserved the possibility of using military force against Taiwan under certain circumstances, one of which was if Taiwan declared independence. Well, the Taiwan government has never accepted the one country, two systems offer, but uh, since that time, it has also avoided explicitly declaring its independence from China. And although the mutual defense treaty with the United States was terminated, uh, Congress passed uh, something called the Taiwan Relations Act, which requires the United States to continue to sell arms to Taiwan and to maintain the capability to defend Taiwan against uh, what is termed any, any attempt to determine Taiwan's future by other than peaceful means. Uh, in any case, back in 1979, China's military was weak and, and oh, I have a picture, oh yes. There's an arm that we sold to Taiwan. That's a F-16 fighter jet. Uh, those, those were sold back in 1992. Um, uh, but in any case, China's military in 1979 was weak and antiquated and China's leadership was focused on economic development, which would have been disrupted if uh, they had started a war over Taiwan. So the prospect of China actually using force against Taiwan um, at that time was more of a theoretical possibility than a near-term threat. Instead, China's strategy towards Taiwan focused on trying to increase economic and social ties between the island and mainland China while uh, isolating Taiwan economically in the hopes that the combination of, of inducements and diplomatic pressure would convince Taiwan to voluntarily in quotation marks, I suppose, uh, enter into unification negotiations with the mainland. 
And Beijing also hoped that rising standards of living on the mainland would help uh, assuage concerns in Taiwan about the relatively island of 20 million people being drowned in a sea of a billion poor Chinese. Now, uh, while China was pursuing this peaceful unification policy, however, changes were occurring in Taiwan. So when the nationalist government uh, had relocated to Taiwan in 1949, as I said, it brought with it large numbers of officials, military personnel, and other people to the Chinese mainland. Um, you know, the uh, Republic of China was a one-party dictatorship at the time. There he is, Chiang Kai-shek, the dictator himself, or Generalissimo, as he preferred to be called. And all the levers of government in Taiwan were controlled by people from the mainland. They forced the locals to learn Mandarin, which was the official language on the mainland, but had never been spoken in Taiwan. Remember, Taiwan had been under Japanese rule since 1895. And they suppressed the, severely suppressed the local culture and language. They also kept the island, the entire island, under martial law until 1987 on the pretext that they were still at war with the Chinese communists. And unsurprisingly, these uh, policies, along with the events of February uh, 1947, which I mentioned earlier, uh, caused a great deal of resentment in Taiwan. And over time, the native Taiwanese who had originally welcomed the islands return to what they thought was their motherland began to see themselves as different from the mainlanders who were ruling over them. Now the KMT recognized the need to co-opt the local population and gradually brought increasing numbers of Taiwan local Taiwanese into the government and the KMT party itself. And they started allowing elections at the local level. Um, but uh, they maintained their grip on the national government continued to insist that they were the rightful government of all China and that Taiwan was just one of their many provinces. And as a result of this, the idea of, have, of Taiwan having its own national identity that was distinct from that of China began to arise and grew over time. Now, beginning in the 1980s, in response to rising internal and external pressure, Taiwan's government began to democratize at the national level as well. Martial law was lifted, non-KMT political parties were legalized, and in the 1990s, Taiwan had, for the first time, direct elections for first its legislature, and then in 1996, for the presidency. Um, throughout this time, Beijing continued its uh, to uh, reiterate as one country, two systems, unification offer to Taiwan, but who it was negotiating with had really changed. Um, as I said, the KMT shared the Communist Party of China's view that Taiwan was but a part of the greater Chinese nation, although the two parties definitely disagreed about who ought to be running that nation. But with the lifting of martial law and the legalization of other political parties, party, political parties in Taiwan began to appear that argued that Taiwan was a separate nation from China and should be independent of it permanently. The largest of these parties was the Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP. Now, when direct elections first began to be held in Taiwan, the KMT was able to hold on to both the presidency and a majority of seats in the legislature. In 2000, however, uh, two different uh, figures within the KMT both wanted to be president. They were unable to agree on who would be president, and who would be vice president, and they wound up running on separate tickets. And the split ticket resulted in the candidate from the DPP, the pro-independence party, there is Chen Shui-bian, to win even though he got less than 50% of the votes. Um, then in um, 1984, he uh, ran for re-election. And uh, in this case, 
Oh, I should say, uh, although he won the presidency, the KMT still maintained its hold on the legislature in 2000. So there were limits on what he could do despite his aspirations to push for Taiwan's independence. Um, and then in 2004, he ran for re-election. This time the KMT fielded a unified ticket and the KMT candidate was actually leading in the polls right up to the eve of the election. Um, but at, uh, on the last day of campaigning, um, both the, uh, this man, Chen Shui Bian, and his vice president, Annette Liu, were shot while in a presidential motorcade. Now, it turned out that both of them were only lightly wounded, um, but they did win the election the next day. And, and the KMT claimed that, um, that the, oh, wait, there we go, um, that uh, the shooting incident had actually been staged in order to generate sympathy for the DPP candidates. And as a result, there were huge protests in Taiwan, up to 500,000 people at a time. Um, and at one point, um, several hundred people actually tried to break into the presidential office building. This part might sound a little familiar, um, but, uh, but they were repelled by police with water cannons. Okay, that part's different. Um, uh, and uh, there was a recount which confirmed that Chen Shui Bian had in fact won and uh, he earned a second term in office. However, the KMT still held on to uh, the majority of seats in the legislature. So again, he was, uh, although he was pro-independence, he was very constrained in what he could do. Now, I should also mention that 2004 was also the year in which a whale exploded on the streets of the very same city in Taiwan where the shooting occurred. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that was a, a portent of what was going to happen later. Um, okay, I just, I figure every talk should have a, an exploding whale in it at some point. Um, okay, so uh, where was I? Uh, oh yes, needless to say, Beijing was not very happy about this pro-independence president in Taiwan. Um, and uh, uh, because there obviously was very little chance that he was going to accept the uh, one country, two systems unification offer or any other unification offer, but at least they could comfort themselves by saying, well, 2000 was a fluke. It was because of the split vote and he wouldn't have been reelected in 2004 if it hadn't been for that assassination attempt. Um, in fact, in 2006, I traveled to mainland China to interview the mainland's experts on Taiwan and I didn't meet a single one who didn't think that the shooting had been staged. In fact, the, uh, exactly what happened has never been solved, by the way. They, uh, the perpetrators both committed suicide as the police were closing in on them, but there's never been any evidence produced either. You know, one of the rumors was that it was the mainland that had, was behind it. Another, obviously, was that it was staged. I've also heard that the shooter was actually just mentally ill. But um, anyways, uh, certainly in the, on the mainland, they believed it was staged and you know, that Chen Shui Bian had manipulated things to keep himself in power. So they were probably relieved in 2008 when a KMT candidate won the election. And so the KMT was back firmly in control of Taiwan's government in 2008. And he was reelected in 2012 and the KMT continued its hold on the legislature. However, um, while all that was going on, public sentiment in Taiwan was, um, uh, oh, I forgot to mention they even, this is the same man as I showed on the previous slide, the KMT candidate, uh, President Ma ying and he even had a meeting with uh, uh, Xi Jinping, a Chinese leader in Singapore in 2015, that was the first time the leaders of Taiwan and mainland China had met ever um, uh, since, since the ROC government fled to Taiwan. Um, however, uh, it did not lead to any unification negotiations, which I think was probably disappointing to Beijing. And as I said, in the meantime, things were really shifting in Taiwan. Okay, laser pointer one more time. 
Actually, I'll try not to use it. So uh, this is a complicated chart and I have an even more complicated one later. But um, so this is about national identity. So uh, pollsters in Taiwan since 1992 have been asking people, what is your nationality? And so, you know, possible answers are, I am Chinese, I am Taiwanese, I am both, or I don't know. Um, I guess if they'd asked me, I would have said American, but I, I'm probably down in, they probably didn't ask me. Uh, I was in Taiwan in 1992 though. So uh, going back to 1992, if you ask people about 45% of them would say I'm both Taiwanese and Chinese. The second most likely answer was I'm Chinese. And only about uh, less than 20% of the people in 1992 said I am Taiwanese only. Um, but if you can look over time, that changed. So after 2008, the most likely answer has now become, I am Taiwanese. Not I'm Taiwanese and Chinese, I'm just Taiwanese. In fact, more than 60%, more than half of the population now identifies as not being Chinese, basically. And then the second most likely answer is I am Taiwanese, but also Chinese. And now less than 4% of the population identify as being only Chinese. So demographic trends are, have definitely not been in Beijing's favor. And um, that is also reflected when people are polled about, you know, how do you feel about unification? If you go back to, um, uh, again, 1994 in this case, the vast majority of people, of course, uh, maybe not of course, but, but most people in Taiwan want throughout all this polling time is for things to say just the way they are. Um, so that's the most popular response to any of these questions. So then the question is, well, what would you like to have happen in the future? And um, back in 1994, about 20% of the population said that um, they would like for Taiwan to be unified with the mainland at some point undefined point in the future. And only 11% said that they wanted Taiwan to unify with the mainland. And the remainder, um, which is about 70%, either didn't know, uh, couldn't decide, or felt like maybe we should decide later, not now. But again, by today, that those numbers have flipped. So now, if you ask people, about 30% will say they hope for Taiwan to eventually be independent, and only about 8% want it to be unified with the mainland. So, as I said, these trends in Taiwan do not seem to suggest that the people of Taiwan are likely to want to unify with um, mainland China. And uh, sure enough, in uh, 2016, um, elections in Taiwan, uh, a, another candidate from the pro-independence DPP party was elected president. And for the first time in Taiwan's history, the DPP won a majority of seats in Taiwan's legislature. So for the first time, you had both the executive and the legislative branch in the hands of pro-independence parties. Now, um, Tsai Ing-wen is a very, uh, pragmatic, cautious politician. She has not done anything to overtly push independence for Taiwan, but certainly everyone in Beijing knows what she stands for. Um, now, as I said, that happened in 2016. So if you're really desperate in Beijing, then you could say, well, maybe that was a fluke and maybe the people of Taiwan will come back to their senses. And uh, in local elections in 2018, um, it seemed like that might be the case when the KMT won most of the mayoral and county magistrate seats that were up for election at that time. But then in um, the 2020 election, so just about this time last year, January of last year, Tsai Ing-wen won, won again. Oops, all right, now I have a picture of her winning, but... Uh, uh, one again, and um, and now you've got to be really desperate in Beijing to convince yourself that Taiwan is ever going to voluntarily accept unification with the mainland. 
but the final nail in the coffin may have come from Hong Kong. So let's go back to Hong Kong. So as I said, um, Hong Kong's transition to Chinese rule went pretty smoothly, at least initially. Over time, however, some problems began to arise. And a couple of them are worth mentioning. First, um, after the 1984 Sino-British agreement on returning Hong Kong, the Chinese government then published its own law that would govern how Hong Kong, Hong Kong would operate after the handover in 1997. And this was called the Hong Kong Basic Law. And it was basically a, uh, a constitution for the region. And one of the clauses in the law said that although Hong Kong's chief executive would initially be appointed by Beijing, as I said, eventually he would be, a, or she, would be elected by universal suffrage. And the target date for that was actually 2017, 20 years after the handover. So around 2014, the government of Hong Kong put forward this proposal for exactly how uh, this uh, election of the chief executive would happen. Um, and it quickly became clear that by universal suffrage, uh, Beijing has simply meant that the citizens of Hong Kong would now be allowed to pick among two or three candidates, all of which would be selected by Beijing. Well, this wasn't what the people of Hong Kong thought universal suffrage meant, and they took to the streets. Um, and uh, this is uh, the central business district in Hong Kong. It was occupied by thousands of people um, at times for a period of 59 days and became known as the Occupy Central Movement, um, named obviously after the Occupy Wall Street Movement here in this country. Um, the Chinese government and, and its proxy, the Hong Kong government stood firm, however, uh, refused to compromise, refused to talk to uh, the protesters in any serious kind of way. Um, and after 79 days, finally lost patience and sent in the police to clear out the central business district. And that was the end of the Occupy Central movement. Um, and um, it wasn't the end of uh, the democracy movement in Hong Kong, however. And again, in 2019, protests again erupted. Now, in this case, the issue uh, was actually over uh, extraditing people from Hong Kong to other places um, it, when they were accused of committing crimes in those other places. So Hong Kong had extradition agreements with a number of countries, including the United States. Um, but didn't allow people to be sent to jurisdictions with it, with which it didn't have such agreements. Well, one of those was actually Taiwan. And, um, and there was a case where a Hong Kong man while on vacation with his girlfriend in Taiwan murdered her and then came back to Hong Kong. And so Taiwan, the government of Taiwan and the government of Hong Kong wanted him extradited to Taiwan to face trial there where the crime had been committed. Um, and the Hong Kong government proposed amending its extradition law so that people could be extradited to other jurisdictions with which Hong Kong did not have agreements under certain circumstances. Now, one of those other jurisdictions to which Hong Kong did not extradite people was the Chinese mainland. And people quickly figured out that if the law were amended, then the government of Hong Kong would be allowed to extradite people to mainland China as well, not just Taiwan. And they took to the streets to protest. Um, and this time the protests were huge. At times up to an estimated 2 million people out of a population of 8 million were on the streets of Hong Kong. Um, and unlike in 2014, the protests didn't end. People kept coming out, um, even uh, in the face of increasingly brutal police repression. Um, and although 
most of the protests were peaceful. There were some that uh, did result in violence. I don't, um, both you know, against the protesters and against the police. I don't think any police were ever killed, but some were badly hurt. And uh, one protest, at least one protester was known to have died, although it's not clear under what circumstances. Um, so violence is a relative term in Burma. Several hundred people right now, as we speak, have been killed in their protests. But by Hong Kong's rather genteel standard, this was a massive disruption. And as I said, uh, Beijing began to lose patience. This went on um, uh, for about a year and a half through the COVID pandemic, which gave the government another pretext for cracking down uh, on public gatherings. And finally, on at 11 p.m. on June 30th of last year, Beijing announced a new national security law for Hong Kong that contained a number of provisions that appeared to violate the idea of one country, two systems. Um, as well as Beijing's own basic law for Hong Kong, which had defined the process by which laws are made in Hong Kong. And it didn't allow for Beijing to just come up with a law and impose it on Hong Kong, for example. Um, indeed, uh, very few people had even seen this law before it was published at 11 p.m. Uh, including Hong Kong's own chief executive herself had not seen it, Carrie Lam. And it took effect just one hour later at midnight on July 1st, 2020. Now, the most worrisome thing about this law was the fact that it specified four new crimes, uh, which were termed secession, subversion, terrorism, and collusion that were only loosely defined as is consistent with China's legal system, but not the British legal system under which Hong Kong uh, has operated. And these laws were punishable by uh, up to life in prison. Um, and uh, this, these laws had a very chilling effect in Taiwan and in, in Hong Kong. Um, a number of political groups simply disbanded in their face. Um, uh, but uh, they have nonetheless been used to arrest uh, about 50 people for crimes such as organizing unauthorized primary elections for the Democratic parties in Taiwan, for advocating for independence for Hong Kong, and uh, other things that up until July 1st of last year were considered protected free speech in Hong Kong. Um, so, in more, more recently, I should say, um, uh, China has amended the way in which Taiwan, uh, I keep saying Taiwan, Hong Kong's legislature is elected. They are now going to be almost all appointed from Beijing instead of having direct elections for at least some of them. Um, and to most people, this is effectively the end of the one country, two systems uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, only 23 years into what had been promised to be at least 50 years. Hong Kong no longer enjoys freedom of speech or assembly and its legal system has now been subordinated to that of the, of the mainland. It still has its capitalist economic system, of course, but so does much of China now at this point. So it's not really any different from the rest of China in that regard. Now, aside from the impact on the freedoms and democratic aspirations of the people of Hong Kong, the greatest impact of this event, however, may have been on Taiwan. As I said, trends in Taiwan are already making it less and less likely that, pe that the people of Taiwan would accept political unification with the mainland. Um, and so here, let me show you this other more complicated chart that I promised. I won't try to explain it all to you, but I just want you to look at, uh, here I will use my laser pointer. Um, the, so first of all, the, uh, this, this dark red line is people um, who uh, want eventual unification with China. You can see that drops 
rather precipitously between 2018 and 2020. These are people who want unification right now. Never a large number, about uh, 3% in 2018, now dropped to 1%. On the other hand, the green lines, which are both this one, these are people who want independence immediately, but particularly this one, those who hope for Taiwan to eventually be independent, now up to about a quarter of the population with the vast majority of people still sort of undecided about uh, Taiwan's long-term future. But it's clear um, that support for unification uh, with the mainland is going in exactly the wrong way from Beijing's point of view. And, um, and if there was any doubt, then what has happened in Hong Kong uh, over the last year means that the one country, two systems solution has now lost all credibility in Taiwan. Um, so uh, I should say some people have proposed that there could be a different solution. This has been talked about for quite some time to uh, Taiwan joining with the mainland. Uh, the one country, two systems formula says that uh, under it, Beijing will be the central government and Taipei, Taiwan's capital, would be a local government. Uh, and some people have said, well, maybe the two nations could share sovereignty as co-equals within some kind of confederation. But China's current leader, Xi Jinping, oops. Uh, oh, yes, I need to, well, I'll get back to that. So there he is, has said no to that. Um, so now what's the problem? The problem is, as I said, Beijing has said there are certain conditions under which it will consider using force against Taiwan, one of which is if Taiwan overtly declares independence. But they have also said that if, um, and let me quote their own words here, if I may, uh, if possibilities for unification have become ex completely exhausted, then that is another condition under which they would consider using force against Taiwan. Um, now, uh, I think at this point, it's pretty obvious that possibilities for unification have been completely exhausted, at least as long as mainland China remains a one-party dictatorship under the Communist Party of China. So the question is whether or not people in Beijing have recognized this. Um, and if so, what their response is going to be. Xi Jinping has said that the Taiwan problem, as he puts it, is one that cannot continue to be passed on from one generation to the next. And as I'm sure you're well aware, China has been steadily upgrading its military capabilities for the past 25 years now. In testimony earlier this month, Admiral Philip Davidson, the commander of the US Indo-Pacific Command, said that he believed that Beijing might attempt to reincorporate Taiwan into the Chinese mainland with the Chinese mainland at some point in the next six years. Not sure quite why he said six years, but uh, six years from 2021 would be 2027, which happens to be the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China. And China's leadership has identified that year as an important milestone. So being able to claim that the territory of Taiwan had been uh, recovered at that point would certainly be a huge boost to their legitimacy. Now, in my assessment, China does not currently have enough amphibious lift capability, despite the picture behind me, uh, to launch a successful invasion of Taiwan. But in coming years, we should certainly keep an eye out for evidence that China is trying to develop the uh, capabilities that would be required um, to bring about forcible unification. So what does all this mean for the United States? Well, the Taiwan Relations Act that I told you about passed in 1979 by US Congress does not legally require the United States to come to Taiwan's defense in the event of an attack from mainland China. Um, but uh, Taiwan is now one of the freest, most democratic countries in the world. And it's a nation to which the United States has a longstanding security equipment. The 
security commitment. So I, I believe that uh, the United States has an interest in Taiwan remaining a free and democratic country, and that any decision about whether to enter into a political union with the mainland should be entirely voluntary on the part of the people of Taiwan. I will also point out that it is not in the interest of the United States, regardless of uh, the status of Taiwan, to have a hostile authoritarian country such as China uh, in possession of the, qi, of the key strategic position that Taiwan occupies. So what should we do? Well, as I said, the Taiwan Relations Act doesn't legally require the United States to come to Taiwan's defense, but um, I believe that Washington should make it clear to Beijing that it plans to do so in uh, virtually any circumstances other than an overt declaration of independence by Taiwan. And second, we need to make sure that we have the capability to actually successfully defend Taiwan. Now, in my opinion, that doesn't require vast amounts of increased defense spending. Um, the current US defense budget, for example, is greater than that of China and all the other countries of the Indo-Pacific region combined. Um, but it does mean that uh, we need to focus our attention on this problem. We're no longer in a post-Cold War world in which the US military can be the world's policeman developing generic forces that are designed to meet every conceivable type of contingency and fighting endless wars of counterinsurgency long after the original reason for them has dissipated. Feel free to boo me for that last line if you want. Instead, I believe we need to focus on acquiring the capability to deter and, and defeat if necessary a very specific adversary in a location that is uniquely challenging for us. This means not just investing in new systems and technologies, of course, although I do love new systems and technologies. More importantly, it means continuing to invest in the human capital of the US military. That means the people we recruit, how we train and promote them, and the organizational culture in which they operate. So now you see this whole thing was actually just an advertisement for the Army War College. Um, and I, I really believe that in the long term, this is where our advantage over countries like China lies. China is gradually closing its technological gap with the US military, but I don't think an authoritarian state like China um, which insists that the primary loyalty of its military is not to the nation or to a set of principles, but to the Communist Party of China, can field a military that values and encourages individual initiative and leadership, and that trusts that the vast majority of its personnel, from the lowliest private to the highest general, when all else fails, will choose to do the right thing. So let that be my endnote, and I look forward to your questions and comments.